Thanks everyone for coming back from your respective tracks and from the break. Uh, for those of you that were in track two this whole time, I'm Jeff Bogaliskis, technical editor for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News, and I was hosting and moderating track one for the presentations. If you haven't seen that one, make sure you check that out when the on-demand version of the event is up. But now I have the great pleasure of introducing our speaker for the closing session, Dr. Yasuhiro Fururichi. As many of you may already know, Dr. Furudichi is a seminal discovery of the M7G or five prime cap at the end of mRNA molecules and subsequent work in this area opened the door to a much greater understanding of eukaryotic biology and mRNA stability. The basic contributions made by Dr. Furudichi also spawned the advent of numerous drug discoveries, such as the recent anti-influenza drug, Zafluza, which is a cap-dependent endonuclease inhibitor. He's had an extensive career spanning more than 50 years and is still active in the scientific community as a visiting professor at the Nagata Pharmaceutical University at the young age of 80. In his presentation today, Dr. Fururichi reflects on his seminal work and what it has meant to him and the scientific community. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm truly happy to be with you at this commemorative mRNA day. First of all, I would like to congratulate the great success of Trilink in pioneering business and sponsorship of mRNA Day to commemorate great history of company. Primarily, my, my appreciation goes to Trilink chemist who unraveled the mRNA cap structure to the cap, clean cap, because I am proud to say I am the father of CAP. CAP is hallmark structure in most cellular and viral mRNAs. The structure is indispensable to begin protein synthesis by binding to initiation factors and ribosomes. It is also essential for stabilizing mRNA molecule at its avoid, as it's avoid in advertent hydrolysis by five prime exonucleases. This gives cap RNA a longer life than bacterial mRNA, which lack cap. Even I dare to imagine that an essential step in eukaryotic cell evolution from primitive prokaryotic cell might have been an acquisition of cap structure. In this respect, I wish Trilink a long life and a greater evolution in its endeavors. On 
this momentous occasion, I would like to tell a story about how I discovered cap structure first in the world. It happened in 1974 at the National Institute of Genetics in Japan, locating near Mount Fuji. Dr. Miura, my boss, and I started a new laboratory in the Institute investigating genomic RNA and messenger RNA of cytoplasmic polyhydrosis virus, which infect silkworm and contain double-stranded RNA. Please see the healthy worm on the left and the virus-infected worm on the right in this figure. The healthy worm, worms eating and digesting mulberry leaves had a dark guts. However, the guts of in infected worm wasn't dark because they had diarrhea and stopped eating. Instead, infected cells contain a white cubical polyhedral protein complex. Imagine this structure as a concrete covered pill box, which protects insect virus in the soil before they emerge in spring. The virus genome comprised 10 RNA segments, indicating that the virus replication with these 10 proteins. To understand how all the segments are assembled in a small particle, we analyzed the three terminus and five terminus. One, uh, I uh, took the three prime end and Dr. Mura took five prime end. We then had a model of end-to-end base paired duplex RNA for each genomic segment. One curious finding was that one of the strand contained two prime or methylated nucleotide at the five prime end. There was no such report before uh, for the mRNA. The virus transcription, the gamma P32 labeled ATP went into the five prime uh, end, suggesting mRNA chain start with PPPA, with A, uh, on uh, methyl, uh, methylated side of strand. Uh, there was another mystery. A strange compound, we call it compound X, was found in each RNA segment. The compound X contained the free ribose moiety, and I published the compound X as non-nucleosidic material, NNM, since it had a net negative charge of minus five and was about five angstrom in length when released from the double-stranded RNA segment by ribonuclease digestion. We thought simply that mRNA made in vitro, in, in vitro uh, was uh, simple, but natural mRNA was complex, having yet unknown modifications, in the, including two prime O methylation of A and compound having compound X. One night in November 1973, I called it serendipity night because it gave rise to an unexpected and excellent result that solved all the problems we had. It's adenosyl methionine, the methyl methylation agent, which I added to the in vitro viral transcription reaction, stimulated mRNA enormously, more than we could ever imagine. Some had never been used in mRNA synthesis before, and I am proud that I, have, I was the first to use SAM this way. As you can see in the figure, the mRNA synthesis reaction was like a rocket launch going up very rapidly, having hundredfold greater efficiency compared to the negative control reaction without SAM. With some two molecule or methyl groups were observed incorporated into mRNA. At the start of mRNA synthesis, surprisingly, they were in the complex compound X, indicating that NNM is at the five prime end of the messenger RNA. 
I called the reaction as methylation coupled transcription and sent a paper about it to the journal Nature. However, however, regrettably, Nature rejected, saying that too busy to publish it. I then began to worry about stolen ideas because SAM was commercially available and it is easy to add SAM into any in vitro reaction and replicate my original, my variable findings. The paper was then quickly submitted to nucleic acid research, NAR, which started 1974. Fortunately, my paper was accepted, but I had to hurry up anyway to characterize the compound X. 1974 was the busiest and most stressful in my life, both personally and professionally. I was then 34 year old man at the time with a wife and three children. In June, I began to work in uh, Dr. Shatkin, Dr. Aaron Shatkin's laboratory in the Roche Institute of Molecular Biology, moving from Mishima, Japan to uh, Natri, New Jersey in the United States. In Roche Institute, I began to examine the effect of SAM on other viruses, such as the human leovirus and a vaccine virus, which contained RNA polymerase in virus particles. To gain more information about compound X in mRNA, we prepared beta P32 labeled nucleotide to find out the five prime structure, which worked very well to get correct uh, structures. As a result, the radioactive beta P32 was incorporated in compound X. It was resistant to alkaline phosphatase, while the radioactive P32 in gamma P32 ATP was not found in X. This fact imp implied that gamma phosphate of the first nucleotide ATP was removed, and the remaining two phosphates remained in the phosphatase resistant form. Accordingly, the candidate structure X was boiled, boiled down to the following two, two, uh, two structures in consideration of the data so far obtained. Meantime, mRNA of real virus and vaccinia virus were also found to be methylated and five prime at the five prime termini. In Roche Institute, uh, Dr. Shatkin welcomed me very warmly and we became a long time collaborator. The Roche Institute was a fantastic institute founded in 1970. It was indeed the Camelot of biomedical science as described by the director, Dr. Hub Weisman. On the first day of the work, I went to see Stella, a woman who handled the purchasing of reagent to get the SAM. Stella said, what kind of man are you hero? asking for such an expensive reagent from the first day. And you have not yet found your room to live other than Howard Johnson Motor Lodge. It was a, a very stressful days, I, I believe. Apparently, uh, my purchase request was outrageous, but it was, accept it was accepted and Stella kindly ordered C14 labeled SAM for my, um, my experiment. This SAM, however, unfortunately not incorporated into the compound X in subsequent transcription reaction. With these results, I was now able to conclude that compound X in cytoplasmic polyhydrosis virus was M7G triphosphate AM P, G, P. And for the human leovirus, it was M7G uh, triphosphate G, M, G. They all, they are all kept. Proudly, I was the primary author for these results and published in Nature in CPB and in PNAS for leovirus. Thus, 
The final stage of CAP discovery was achieved by cooperation of two institutions in Japan and the USA, and by Yang Fuichi, uh, I am, uh, who worked in two institutions during the time, 1974. The compound X existed in all eukaryotic mRNA and nuclear uh, uh, pre-mRNA and mRNA from various eukaryotic viruses uh, examined, indicating that it was a typical structure in the world of higher organisms and their viruses. During one of our paper writing meeting with Jim Darnell at the Rockefeller University, Shatkin and myself, we three agreed unanimously to replace the lengthy name of uh, uh, block, blocked and methylated five prime terminal structure to cap uh, with cap. I'm happy with this nickname. It is comprehensive in scope and very sexy too. Indeed, it was adopted worldwide. It was adopted uh, quickly worldwide. Moreover, new world could easily be generated from this nickname, such as capping, decapping, cap dependency, cap binding, and even cap snatching uh, uh, that happens in the influenza virus transcription. Next, I studied the enzymes, enzyme uh, 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 enzymatic process of cap formation using human virus. It was soon found that four enzymes were involved to yield the cap one structure. The sequential reaction allowed me to prepare three different messenger RNA with five prime terminal structures. One first one is the um, uh, M7G cap, and the second one was broke but unmethylated structure, and the third one was unbroke and unmethylated uh, uh, five prime terminal structure containing mRNA. Uh, the, um, by maneuvering, this was done by maneuvering the concentration of pyrophosphate and SAM. Finally, the three different types of mRNA were P32 labeled and micro-injected to frog oocyte. Their stability in the cell was then measured. The results were quite straightforward. Only the capped RNA was stable and active in translation. Many other experiments supported now, now were accepted knowledge that CAP stabilizes mRNA and stimulate mRNA translation, which now substantiates the reliable, reliable efficacy of the mRNA vaccine. I have been indeed fortunate to be one of the major player in discovering CAP structure and clarifying the essential biological role of CAP. And that contributed to understanding gene expression and though indirectly to save millions of people from coronavirus uh, pandemic infection, uh, which are included in the mRNA vaccines. Thank you very much. Wonderful presentation, Dr. Furichi. Thank you so much for your amazing contributions to this field. We really appreciate you joining us today and sharing that with us. Now, I'm gonna hand things back over to my colleague, Kevin, for the closing remarks. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, thank you, Dr. Furu Furuichi, for a really a, a great uh, look back at some of the key moments in mRNA biology and a reminder of the rich uh, history in this field. Well, that just about puts a cap on mRNA day for 2021. 
We're going to give the last word today to Trilink uh, with a short fireside chat from a group of company executives hosted by Trilink's Chief Operating Officer, Brian Neal, who you met at the beginning of the program today, discussing the significance of mRNA Day and especially their critical work during the pandemic. Guys, what an amazing couple of years it's been. Who would have known where we'd be today going through a global pandemic? All these things that came together in this business celebrating mRNA Day today. It's really been an unbelievable accomplishment what we've done. We're sitting here with our state-of-the-art manufacturing building behind us. And it's just such an interesting story to tell, right? Two years ago, we moved into this building. Who would have known at that time that there would be a global pandemic on the rise? and that really the technology that would bring us where we need to be was mRNA. We designed this building ultimately to be an mRNA manufacturing facility, also to scale up our clean cap products as well. But once we saw early 2020 that this pandemic likely could be solved by mRNA, we had the mission in front of us to really scale this facility up. We took on three emergency construction projects working with the city of San Diego. We had to get our our team back together, so to speak, as we called it at the time, our engineers, our construction companies that we worked with to initially, initially get this building set up, and all the team that would take to all ultimately build a 24-7 operation and do that 24-7 construction. So today we sit here and we can look at our accomplishments and know that we're not done yet with the fight, but we're much stronger than we were two years ago even. Who would have thought in just 12 months our partners, Pfizer and BioNTech, would have developed an mRNA vaccine to help solve the global pandemic. We're part of that program. It's been an amazing opportunity for us as a company and as individuals. So much went into that over the last two years. I'd love to hear more about some thoughts about what it took to do this work. I thought I'd start with Jeremy. Jeremy, what do you think? What, what did it take for us to open this facility? As VP of Operations, so much had to come together. I'm curious to hear what you have to say about it. Uh, you brought up a couple of uh, uh, good points there. You talked about the uh, facilities and equipment. I'll touch base a little bit uh, on the, that's half the challenge. I'll touch base on the other half that you mentioned, the uh, building sustainable performance. So developing out the uh, team and the processes that uh, support uh, preclinical, clinical, uh, sustainable, compliant performance, I think is uh, definitely uh, one of the uh, more significant challenges. So really being able to scale the quality of the facility to meet the needs of ultimately patients around us was key. Uh, Chris Perez, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Um, You've been with us for two decades and have had a massive part in building out this facility, not just to initially launch this facility, but ultimately to do these emergency construction projects that we had to go through in 2020. What are your thoughts on what it took to get this all done? Interesting. So it took a partnership um, and trust within the team, not just internally, but externally. Um, it was a great experience and, and a challenging experience at that, um, working through a pandemic in support of the pandemic, all the supply constraints and um, timelines. We had, to, we had to build quick and fast. We had to trust each other to ensure that we understood what the end goal was um, and the world needed us. And that's where we came in. And Mike, you know, I can't help think of the science and what's had to happen in the last couple of years to ultimately develop these products. We've been at it for, you know, a good five, six years, but there's been so much advance. What does this facility allow us to do from a scientific perspective, ultimately for our partners and for patients from, from your point of view? Yeah, when I think about, you know, this facility, and I think where we were when we were making clean cap. What this facility really did is it allowed us to scale to meet the needs of Pfizer and the other um, COVID-19 programs out there. But I also think it's had an added benefit of allowing us with these new processes that we use to scale up clean cap to adopt that and use them in other small molecule programs, for instance, NTPs and, and molecules like that. So when I think of the facility, I, those are the things that I think about. So it's interesting, there's the chemistry side of what we do, clean cap fits into that. Then there's the biological side of what we do. Mm -hmm. Julie Powers runs our GMP technical operations for the company and has been with us also for quite a long run. You've been here from the very beginning with us. 
in terms of our development into a GMP manufacturer and services provider. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on the biologic side of, of, of what we do every day and what this building has enabled us to do and will continue to enable us to do. Yeah, so it's really allowed us to continue to grow with our customers and to keep up with the increasing demand for large scale, high quality mRNA. Um, we have new equipment, increased uh, clean room space, and that's allowed us to support multiple simultaneous programs, which is really important as we continue to grow and this the industry continues to grow. Um, we also have brought in new teams that allow us to really optimize and customize manufacture for our clients for their specific mRNA. So that helps them uh, meet their quality goals. So all this has come together in such a short period of time. We've all been through so much to get there. Our partners have been through, it seems like at times even more. Um, it's just really been exciting to be part of this. I take it back to Two years ago, we had mRNA day here on site before the pandemic, not knowing what would happen. Here we are now, and you have to think, well, what does it really mean to us individually? What does it mean to this business, this company, um, all the employees that work here? And Jessica, our very first customers for both CleanCap and mRNA services were with you in the beginning. I'm curious what mRNA day means to you. I mean, for me, it's really a time to reflect on the past, the present, and the future of mRNA. As you mentioned, I mean, mRNA Day was established in 2019. It was pre-pandemic. And even at that time, we recognized that mRNA was a special molecule. Um, right now, everything's about COVID and how we can support that. But what's most exciting for me is really the future. Uh, mRNA promises to next tackle cancer, and I think that's really going to be the greatest accomplishment if mRNA can cure cancer. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what our partners can do. Reflecting back in the end for, for Trilink as a company, it's been amazing to be on this journey together. So much has happened in the last two years. Everything from our original mRNA day launched here on site two years ago, working through a pandemic, thinking about the personal lives that we have and how we manage that at home, how we manage that with the emergency builds that we had to do on site here to keep up with our partners, ultimately to keep up with the, the global health crisis and demand for a COVID-19 vaccine. It's really been an amazing story. It couldn't have been done without everyone here today, everyone that's in this building today, and really the executive team here that supported us all the way through, all of our customers, all of the partners that we have. It's been super exciting. I think this is just the beginning and I can't wait for more chapters to begin with everyone here today. Thank you. Our huge thanks to Trilink for their tremendous work in this field and uh, allowing us the privilege of partnering with them to, uh, to host mRNA Day today. Uh, thanks, uh, huge thanks to also to my co-hosts and moderators, uh, Jeff Bugaliskis and Juliana Lemure and the entire Gen Multimedia production team, uh, Jeff, Liana Jabs, Bobby Grandone, Hannah Turner, and Danny Buda. Thanks to all of our speakers uh, for really exciting uh, presentations uh, and great discussion. Most of all, we want to thank you for tuning in today. Uh, mRNA Day will be available to watch on demand in its entirety within about a week or so. So look for that to be posted next week and you can share with friends and colleagues. So for everybody at Gen and the CRISPR Journal, I'm Kevin Davis. Goodbye for now.